try and say which Dubbed Heaven entry was the best game in the franchise, well you probably already know that my answer to that is Yggdra Union if you checked the previous video in this retrospective. However, if I were to change that to what I think is the most unique game in the Dubbed Heaven franchise, actually scratch that, one of the most unique games I've ever played, that would be Knights in a Nightmare hands down. The best way I can describe Knights in a Nightmare is that it's a strategic bullet hell. Sounds immediately weird, right? Making use of the DS touchscreen as that's the platform it came out on, it's not really a tactics game, it's not a shump at all either, but somehow it's something in between the two. They combined a constantly dwindling resource grind and time positioning, alongside dodging a constant hail of bullets. Where Knights in a Nightmare shines even beyond the fact that it's probably one of the most unique games ever created, is that the atmosphere of the game is brilliant. The strangeness of the gameplay combined with a somber, almost fairy tale like setup to the story leads to a pretty special experience. The story is simultaneously one of the most interesting in the franchise while also being the most non-linear one. Honestly, if Knights in the Nightmare didn't have a whole lot of annoying parts to it, I'd probably consider it my favorite out of the four. As it stands, I think the game is just a tad bit too unfriendly to new players for me to wholeheartedly love it. There's a lot to talk about and a learning curve that might as well be a cliff, so let's just get straight into it. Knights in the Nightmare is episode 4 of the Depth Heaven franchise. Even though it's the third game to come out, as Episode 3 was originally supposed to be a PC MMORPG that got announced in 2008 and silently disappeared from the world after that. In truth though, a PC MMORPG sounds like an absolutely awful idea in 2008, especially because Sting would be making it and MMORPGs are pretty notorious for needing pretty big budgets and big teams to get running, both of which Sting was not. Instead of that, Knights in a Nightmare came out in 2008 on the Nintendo DS. It later got ported to the PlayStation Portable in 2010, but unlike what I've said for every game up until now, it's pretty clear that this game was designed from the ground up to be played on the DS. Like many DS games, Knights in a Nightmare incorporates touchscreen controls into the mechanics of the gameplay. But unlike most games on the DS, these touch controls aren't just some nonsense gimmick that was slapped on last second like, say, Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow, but rather it was a part of the core mechanic of the game. While this could be considered a strategy game, a more accurate term would be a strategic bullet hell. And you can probably imagine how important the touchscreen functions are when you are using them to dodge a million bullets on the screen while activating attacks and skills. I bring this all up because I really want to stress the importance of the touchscreen in Knights in the Nightmare. Then I want to say that while I played the original DS version, I completed the game on PSP which is where all this footage comes from. The PSP version has better graphics, a slightly more refined soundtrack, and an extra scenario where you get to play as Yggdra because sure why not. The DS version has better integration of the central bullet hell mechanic because moving the wisp with the stylus is way easier than trying to move around with the PSP's terrible thumbstick. There is a Switch version but just like with the Yggdra Union it's Japanese only and probably is just a port of the PSP version so I'm not going to talk about that. Personally, I think the DS version plays better but I checked out the PSP version because the screen was way bigger and I wanted to see if it was still playable even without the stylus. And I can safely say that the PSP version was a fun time, even with a slightly more janky control system. I wanted to initially say that Knights of the Nightmare is the weirdest game I've ever played, but honestly I've played a lot of absolute nonsense, so I can't actually say that. What I can say however is that it's one of the most interesting games I've ever experienced, and it's definitely the weirdest one out of the Depth Heaven franchise. It's hard to describe, but as you've already seen, I've taken to calling it a strategic bullet hell, so let's break down what that actually means. For the strategic portion, the basic gameplay consists of the preparation phase and battle phase. During preparation before each battle is where you deal with leveling up units, combining weapons, trans sewing, or enhancing weapons. Each unit is only able to attack and utilize special skills with one weapon type, and every unit has vitality, which is depleted with every single attack, skill usage, getting hit, or literally everything involved with sending them into battle. When it runs out, they're dead permanently. The only way to raise vitality is by leveling them up, which does have a cap that's decided by their max level, and Transo, which involves sacrificing one knight in order to increase the vitality and max level of another. As for the bullet hell section, Every stage in the game is essentially a battle where you select your unit, amount depending on the stage, and what four weapons and items you bring to that turn of the battle. 
The only items in the game aside from weapons are key items found during battle through breaking objects and other secrets, and are used to recruit all the knights you come across throughout every stage of the game or to weaken bosses or trade for better items. Every key item only corresponds to one single character and are otherwise useful only for dismantling. Each turn of the battle is a 60 second session where you attempt to break objects and defeat as many enemies as you can during the time limit. The bullet hell part comes from how you control the wits during the battle, where in order to use your weapons and items, you have to drag each one from the corner of the screen onto the unit you want to use it on, all the while dodging the hell of bullets coming from the enemies on screen. On DS, you get to control the wits using a stylish which feels a lot more natural, while on the PSP version it's a tad stiffer using the analog stick which is famous for being terrible. The difference here isn't too bad, but once you start getting to stuff like launches, element changing, additional damage, gear jamming, all of which requires wisp movement, it does kind of make you miss a stylus a little more if you're playing on the PSP version. Positioning and knowing what units and weapons to bring is insanely important to winning any fight, as every weapon type has its own unique hit patterns, and figure out enemy movement patterns so that you can select the appropriate attacks to maximize damage while minimizing uses to conserve vitality is what separates the good players from the bad. Every hit taken by the Wisp while you're in the process of moving items and charging attacks reduces time on a 60 second timer, and once you reach zero, that turn ends and a new one begins where you can then change your units and items. This back and forth continues onwards until you make a row or column on the diagonal line on the matrix, which ends the stage. Obviously, I've glossed over quite a few things in this explanation. Stuff like fog, MP, what is a matrix, effects, elements, chaos and law phases, what goes into upgrading weapons, but I want to give a basic rundown while pointing out one of the biggest issues with Knights in the Nightmare. The Depth Heaven franchise in general is famous for having their systems be overly convoluted. I think most of the games are actually really fun and interesting, but I also think they sometimes don't do the greatest job explaining many of these mechanics. In Riviera, this wasn't a problem because that game is easy. In Digital Union, it wasn't bad because although there was a lot to learn, they also had solid tutorials all the way to the end of the game that point out whenever a new mechanic is introduced. Knights in the Nightmare is simultaneously the most out there game in the franchise while also having the most janky tutorial. You notice one thing very quickly upon clicking the teachings buttons on the title screen, and that's the fact that it's really long. There are a ton of tutorials on all the little different features in the game, and going through every single one would take like 40 minutes, which I think is both intimidating and a little much for someone who hasn't even started the game yet. When you start a new playthrough, the game does ask you if you want to go through at least the most basic of tutorials, which sounds fine, except like most Depth Heaven games, you probably do want to know about everything to effectively play, otherwise you'll probably have trouble beating the game. The good ones like the tutorial missions which actually check to make sure you know what you're doing are entirely optional which seems a little weird. Most of the other tutorials are just giant info dumps, although this might come from the fact that supposedly the North American DS version had tutorials added onto it to make the game easier to understand, which might be why it's separated like this. Knights in the Nightmare is a game that is quite a bit strange compared to the usual games that people are used to, and the fact that the tutorial comes in a giant text dump probably doesn't help anyone. What is probably more annoying than that, however, is how some of the secrets in the game are found. Most of the key items are pretty easy for the most part, as they mostly appear due to breaking an object or terrain on the field. What I think is dumb are the key items that only appear after a object respawns, which means that if you're out there trying to get all of them, you have to spend time just skipping turns waiting for them to respawn after breaking all of them once. Granted, none of the recruit key items in the game are hidden inside the respawnable ones, only the tradable ones for powerful items, or the ones for weakening bosses are usually hidden in them, but here's the thing. That fact isn't something you would know about this game, unless you looked up a walkthrough. For most people, once they discover an object respawns and has more key items, they would then end up trying to wait for four more turns after destroying every object for every subsequent battle so that they don't end up missing any key items. In the end, I think trying to go for these respawnable items makes the game feel way worse than it needs to, and while in hindsight, the fact that there's no recruitable key items means that most players shouldn't bother to go after them in the first place isn't something that player would know at all unless they consulted a walkthrough. 
What's worse than all of this though, is the requirements for getting the good ending of the game. So Knights in the Nightmare has technically about 12 endings we're trying to be all fancy about it, but assuming we only play the game once, it has 4 including the bad one where we just straight lose. The big requirement for all of the good endings is recruiting and keeping Algiri all the way till the end as she's important story wise, as well as attaining the Encardia. What I want to focus on here is the latter requirement. The Encardia is Marietta's staff, and is hidden in a secret dungeon. In order to access that secret dungeon on stage 23, we have to know somehow that there is a secret spot that is breakable on this map. Specifically, this unassuming square that is on a slightly lower elevation than everything else. Which is something you'd probably only find out by accident while trying to whack this bottom enemy. The biggest reason why it's so unassuming, however, is because this is probably the only hidden spot in the entire game. Every other breakable object tends to be pretty visible. We also then have to hit it as many times as it takes to break it, which is like 26 hits or some nonsense. And then it will give one item. Not only that, we are then supposed to know that we have to keep on hitting it until it breaks a second time, which then opens up the secret to chapter 23.5. The only real hint to all of this? The mysteriously log 23 turn limit we are given in this chapter. How you are supposed to discover this organically without any outside help is beyond me. This is ridiculous, and the fact that it's vital for the good end of the game is insane to me. What's even crazier is that during the secret chapter, the weapon you need is hidden in one of these chests randomly, which is bad because the player doesn't know that they are looking for this weapon in the first place, and all this boss is trying to do is destroy these chests permanently so that the player can't get the item. I could totally see a world where a new player who's playing Knights in a Nightmare completely blind somehow gets to the secret stage and then ends up defeating the boss without picking up the Encardia because it happened to be in the first box that the boss destroyed, thereby locking him out of the good ending for the entire playthrough. Algiri at least makes a ton of sense and only requires one key item near the end of the game, unlike the madness that is Encardia. Now, even though I've spent the last 5-ish minutes complaining about the tutorials, hidden key items, and the secret good ending, you probably realize that I haven't really been saying much about the gameplay itself. And that's because I actually do really like how Knights in the Nightmare does it. I think the combination of bullet hell dodging with their unique blend of tactical gameplay works really well, the frantic pace of trying to balance between when to dodge bullets and when to go for the perfect hit is a fun dynamic. All the little additional things like spinning the jamming gears to stun enemies who are about to use their ultra move, mixing and matching the right elements, thinking of what weapons to bring after realizing how each enemy moves, using the unique abilities of cavalry and duelists to actually move your knights, then swap to another class for the perfect positioning, all of that is really fun and engaging, and that's the stuff I love about Knights and Nightmare. Most of the issues I see with the game come from outside the main gameplay loop. If you do ignore all the respawnable objects though, the game flows a lot better. At its core, it's a great game, it just does a bad job of selling itself and explaining what's going on, which is doubly bad for Knights in a Nightmare because of how weird it is already. Having a secret to unlocking your game's good ending is completely fine, in fact, I do like that sort of thing. It's just that you also need to have some sort of way for your player to understand how to get the good ending. Offer some sort of a hint as to its existence, as having a turn limit that happens to be higher than the rest of the game, it's still too vague. As I always say in every entry in the series, music is solid. I don't have too much to say about it, hopefully what you've been hearing in the background is enough for it to speak for itself. I will at least give special shoutouts to The Spoke, a haunting melody which accompanies the beginning of every stage and really sets the mood for the entire game as a whole. It's very unassuming, it's not bombastic, not rock out awesome, but if I had to pick what I think best represented Nights in a Nightmare, that would be the song i pick out. Somehow we've gotten this far without me meshing the story at all, which is the first for the series, and that's because I think, surprisingly enough, Nights in a Nightmare's greatest strength is not the strange gameplay that it's most known for, but rather the atmosphere that comes with everything about it. From the strange, almost fairy tale like story involving the redemption of a Valkyrie and the plight of a ruined kingdom, the melancholic music that accompanies the start of every stage, 
Paired with a narration that preludes every battle with an almost somber tone, the unique gameplay that involves using the souls of fallen soldiers, all of this combines into what is almost an ethereal feel to the entire story. I think the approach to telling the story in both the past and present is a really cool idea. While we are currently playing as the Wisp traversing through the lands of his ruined kingdom, we simultaneously are also learning about what happened to the knights who used to live in this kingdom, and what exactly has led everything to this point. Knights in the Nightmare is a non-linear tale, not just in the way the story is presented both in past and present, but also how characters are portrayed. Many of the knights all have different relationships to one another, even down to what each knighthood represents, but finding out about all of that is entirely up to the player's discretion through listening to their conversations and trying out different combinations during specific battles. There are so many unique pieces of dialogue that only come about through trial and error, and piecing all those little relationships through them is quite enjoyable in of itself. While it's easy to see them as disposable as many of the knights only appear for like one or two events and then quickly perish right after, even the very nature of the game's transsoul function requires you to sacrifice one knight's soul for another. However, despite all of that, finding reasons to care about each individual knight and discovering what little stories each one has still manages to be a very endearing part of the story. I really respect how somber Knights in the Nightmare is. This isn't the triumphant tale where the recently deceased king returns to lead his people back to victory, but rather it's a story of a lost soul, one who has returned to rectify the mistakes that has led his kingdom to fall. He isn't here to revive what has been lost, but rather to stop further destruction from consuming the rest of the world. It's pretty clear after seeing what has happened that even if he managed to stop the evil that he has been fated to do from the beginning, his kingdom will still remain ruined, and all the people he's lost will probably never come back. When a knight joins the team, they would have only been able to do so because they too have perished. Many of the characters face ultimately cruel ends, and this extends even beyond the knights who join our party. There are others, such as the Prince of the Kingdom, who has turned into a werewolf which we must defeat early on. This particular fact of his origin isn't something we are told directly about, but it rather is something which we can infer from the events we see in the story. I do like how much of the background for the story is left entirely up to the player to discover, or completely ignore if they don't really care about it. I won't spoil what exactly happens, but I will say that I really respect the direction the game takes all the way until the good ending. What's also nice is that aside from unlocking hard mode after being the game, you also unlock two additional routes which change up the story. This fact alone offers a good reason to try a higher difficulty alongside these new routes. Hard mode is entirely worth doing as the game is decently challenging on normal, but I think it probably shines even more on hard mode, especially after you're acclimated to how the game works. The original game only added the blue Melia route, but the PSP version also has the Yggdra route, which is probably going to be a tad bit more lighthearted, considering the first few early chapters I saw. Melia's route has more unique knights not present in the original Maria route, and even some different bosses. Yggdra's route, no idea personally, as I only started a few of the early chapters. Although I heard that it's basically the same as Maria's route for all intents and purposes. Knights in the Nightmare is truly something special, from the gameplay to the melancholic story, and the only reason why I think it's not considered quite as highly as Yggdra Union is the fact that it's held back by not really having a good enough tutorial to back up the very different gameplay that most people aren't used to. That's not to say the information isn't there, but rather it's just not explained in a very enticing way. A big text dump with pictures just isn't really the way to go, and as much fun as it is to watch Yggdra be all cute when explaining, that still doesn't make retaining that information any easier. Combine that with a couple of aggravating mechanics like hidden key items and responding objects, and it makes for a slightly frustrating experience. I think past those annoyances, however, lies a pretty compelling narrative accompanied by an incredibly unique experience. It tells a very dark story that is covered by the art and obfuscated by the way the story is portrayed. It's a game like no other, and ultimately, isn't that really what the Death Heaven franchise is all about? If you have anything you'd like to say about Knights in the Nightmare, your own experience with it, the frustrations that you had, your favorite night maybe, feel free to share that down in the comments below. All the supporter stuff, like, subscribe, notifications are in the same place as always. I'll see you later. Till next time with Gungnir.